Thank you for um, inviting me to this great uh, event. Um, I just want to say, you know, we rec we, um, I was reflecting on when I first met Pear. It was in a back in the early 2000s in a co project called Shark. And we at that time said, we need to get software and hardware working together. Um, we haven't done that, and maybe because that project had 20 different architectures, but that's another story. Um, but maybe by the end of this lecture, or this um, opinion, we will start working together. I'll say a little bit more about it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great, thanks. Okay, well, let's say some very obvious stuff. I don't often get to do more as law, but I get to do it today. Um, the last 50 years, we've seen about a million-fold increase in performance, from a very small thing there, which could land things on the moon, to this modern thing today that helps us do our Twitter feeds. Okay, so it's a million times got faster. And that's really due to Moore's law. More transistors meant things go faster. Hooray. Okay, I don't think anybody's really going to disagree with that. Um, but really, from my point of view, 50 years of uh, Moore's laws really enabled the digital age. Everything we've around us is based on that um, ever-ending trend. And it's really been the basis for software investment and growth. Knowing that you can actually rely on ever greater performance means that people can put time into r developing software that run the world today. So, in some sense, people like me, who live over in the sunny island of Scotland, can write their software, while people over in cold Gothenburg can develop their hardware and the two can get on quite nice, because we've got a contract that links the two of us. And what is that contract? Well, we've heard it many times today in different ways. It's called the ISA. So it means that we've got a natural way of talking, getting on with our own work without worrying about each other. And what I'm going to say today is I think that contract's going to break down, but I've got an upbeat message to say how we can go forward. So let's have a look at that 50-year contract. Well, it's enabled uh, 50 years of software growth. Um, the contract is hardware may change under the hood, from small to very fast. Um, but the hardware software interface remains the same. That contract remains the same. This soft means that software in today is guaranteed to run tomorrow. And it's really the basis of multi-billion pound, uh, multi or multi-billion dollar, or multi-billion euro, for a while, industry. Um, however, as we all know, Moore's law is looking like it's coming to an end. So this is an Intel slide, not mine. And you see this kind of general plateauing maybe in the next 10 to 15 years, or maybe for Pair 28. And what we see is that Moore's law is coming to an end. So this hardware software contract is beginning to break down. So the question for me is, is this the end of sustainable software performance growth? Are we just going to have harder programming, slower machines, or more and more energy expended? Or is there a way out of this? Um, or maybe on a more personal level, <laughs> Are we going to see a breakdown between <laughs> those of us who live on the left of Scotland and, uh, and um, Gothenburg? Is Brexit going to tear us apart? Well, maybe it is, but maybe I've got a solution around that. Maybe um, Pears Hobby will help us get there. <laughs> so, um, what is this hardware software contract? What's breaking down? Well, as we've heard today, technology means that um, uh, we're going to have more and more specialized bits of hardware, heterogeneous processes, or I learned a new phrase yesterday, refrigerators, or as we call them, fridges in the UK, fast accelerators that may uh, can be turned on and off when we get one meter from the goal line. Um, so what it means is, in the old days, we used to sit at our desks writing out with our Turing machines, writing zeros and ones, and cranking a handle. I'm afraid we haven't got those anymore. We're going to things called thread processing, tensor processing units, or some more fa fancy specialized hardware. Now, if you're an architecture guy, these are great up to 100,000 times performance energy gains, depending on how you start your baselines, where the software is. Massive potential performance improvements. That's where the excitement is. However, there's a small oint fly in the ointment. What is that small fly? Well, actually, software can't fit on top of that. There's no free lunch. So this is what I consider to be the heterogeneous crisis or the accelerator crisis. Um, hardware innovation is going to stall if software can't fit on it. And I think this is going to be a fundamental issue for the next 20 years, how to make software fit on really weird hardware. So what do we need to do? We have to rethink that contract, the way hardware and software interact in a way that works for both of us, so we can both innovate. And another way, it's really maybe for us, maybe we can think about how we can enjoy the European Economic Union, so we can be part of you in a different way and still keep on interacting. <laughs> So let's think of that question in a little bit more detail. <laughs> Maybe Catalonia, that's how much. That's too early in the day. Too early, too early. Too early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
So this is not a new problem, and I'm sure everybody in this room has got an opinion about this. So the f really, it's about tet taming this heterogeneous or accelerator zoo. We got some new applications, some legacy code, and we got maybe specialized or fast processes or accelerators, and we want to get the two to get on with each other. So what are the current approaches to this? Well, there's the language-based approach. It's become a really clever, sophisticated parallel programming language. So the user has to rewrite their code in this new language, but hopefully it's worthwhile. But then you're also going to have a new compiler for each of these new devices. And there's going to be a tension there. The closer it is to the hardware, the compiler works easier, but it's harder for the programmer. The higher it is up there, it's easier for the programmer, it's harder for the systems people. There's going to be a natural tension there. And really means we're going to have to have agree on a universal parallel language. That may be hard to do. And we're going to need an optimizing compiler for every particular accelerator out there. Again, that might be very hard to do. So. Is there any other approach to this uh, problem? Well, there is um, uh, an idea of DSLs, domain-specific languages. These try to be a bit more clever. What they're trying to do is actually have a focus on a specialized part of the space, and you can actually have something which is near the application and can be optimized for your hardware. So you can run on one particular process, another, another, another. So that's one way forward, and it's, it's quite popular at the moment. However, what it means is you're going to have many specialized languages, and your poor programmer has to rewrite the code in each one of these DSLs and hope it's going to be there for tomorrow. What happens if the DSLs drop out? What happens if they don't work on any new processes? Then you have to all this really mangled legacy code with DSLs everywhere. So I don't think either of these approaches are going to be the best way forward. I'd like you to consider another way. Look at what we do at the moment. Programmers want to use accelerators that should use GPUs often use specialized libraries. And here's a whole list of them that are on the NVIDIA machine, right? These work well. The reason we use libraries is because the compilers and software people normally write don't give you good performance. So my view is, rather than building a new compiler for every new platform, just use the best library currently runs on it and fit your code to it. So I believe libraries and DSLs are the new ISA. They're the instruction set we actually have to target. They can change. We can adapt to change. We've used machine learning to be able to do that. These are our targets. These aren't the starting points. They're the end points for software compiler writers. So let me try and take you on a little journey about how I think that will play out and my approach to trying to solve some of the technical difficulties. So this is what we used to do. You put legacy program or new program. The thing is, the reason I word legacy, it, tomorrow's software will be legacy soon, right? You have people are writing legacy software right at this very moment. It's not like it's going to get better any day. It's always going to be more and more of software that was written with a particular view in mind. And we've got to match it down to these um, hardware accelerators G, uh, or general purpose machines. And we generally have to have a very low level, but very Turing complete, like wide ISA. So we have to look, take your program and map it all the way down there. I think, say, we need to look at this differently. How are we going to look at it differently? Well, just look what runs on at the moment. So you may have some the poly, polyhedra compiler running on there, or threaded building blocks. You may have OpenGL, or you may have a specialized um, uh, uh, FFT running on your FPGA. And these are just interfaces that are available. And the compiler's job is not to try and implement all of those. They may or may not exist. Your job is actually just to match them to the code you have today. So these things exist. Our job is to match it to that hardware, to your program. So in other words, we're trying, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel, we just try to st leverage the wheels and try to be a bit higher level in our thinking. OK, so let's see, how, where's that going to take us? Well, <coughs> if you're an architecture person, you say, what does this give for me? Well, you can say, let's say there exists this thing called the space of all possible interesting programs you want to know about. And what you want to do is build your hardware. So which one are you going to build? Well, if you pick the wrong one, it's going to be very expensive. It's not going to fit anybody's programs. So rather than do this, you can ask a different question. Why don't you just provide an interface that describes what your hardware does? And maybe some performance cost estimate, you know, how good it's going to run on particular applications. And then you can learn how many of those interfaces actually match your program space. And you can develop a new type of trade-off called the performance coverage curve. So it may be a very specialized bit of hardware, but it doesn't cover many programs. Or it's a very general bit of hardware, but its performance is not great. And then you, as an architect, get to play in this space, the performance coverage space. Once you've picked your little point you're interested in, you go build the hardware. So this, way of soft, this idea of being able to match hardware interfaces to software enables hardware designs to play with a new um, design space called the performance coverage space. 
Now, that all sounds very nice, there's lots of um, slides, uh, but in some sense, how does any of this work in practice? Is it just a hot air? Well, recently we've actually tried to put this idea in uh, using a thing called idioms and constraints. And we had a recently paper published earlier this year. What it tries to do is detect code structure that match these interfaces. So we had some hardware down the bottom here, and we're interested in using interfaces such as general sparse linear algebra libraries or um, a DSL such as Halide or Lyft. And we want to be able to match programs to them. And the way we did that, we developed a new language called an Indian description language. This gets translated to constraints, there's constraints run over your program, and voila, it automatically matches those bits of the program that fit the hardware, cuts them out, stitches them back together, and you're done. So what we're trying to say is that no longer do you have to worry about the ISA of these things. You look at these high-level interfaces, and you just write it in a high-level language. To give you an example of what the language can do, you can represent, say, sparse uh, computation, about 20 lines of this language. Polyhedral compilation can be represented about 45 lines. So you have a technique to actually um, go over your code and make it stick to any new interface. You had a new bit of hardware, you just stick a new description in, off you go. So preliminary findings, I'm not going to go through the numbers, it's not that type of talk. It works for large numbers of benchmarks. It finds things that normal compilers don't find. And, it also <coughs> and it's open source as well, so you can download it and track it to see if we're telling the truth. OK, so that's one type of vision. But where do we go from there? Where do we go from to state going forward? This, in fact, is supposed to be a forward-looking talk. Well, yeah, so what's next? Well, I try to look at our career, and what I'm really excited about is endless automation. Right? Always trying to put myself out of a job, and then going on and on and on and on. So we don't want to have to write description languages. What I want us to develop is a blue box. So what does this blue box do? Well, you throw in the program. You throw in the hardware, and that's it. You let them stew for a week, and what it does, it learns what the hardware does. And once you can learn what the hardware does, it automatically generates a compiler that matches your, source, your code to the hardware with no hands, okay? no intervention. So that's the grand vision of challenge we want to do. Automatically match hardware to software without any human intervention. OK, so how are we actually going to do that? Well, what we need to do is eliminate that description language we've put in. So you have to automatically determine what hardware does over here. Hardware is represented as a red uh, star. Software over there is uh, where we want to get to. So if you automatically want to determine what hardware does, I've got some ideas about how we do that. Then we can automatically match it to software. Once we've done that, we can automatically select the hardware that best fits. Then we automatically optimize software to fit that new hardware. And therefore, we can reconcile hardware and software together. So the endless automation is the way we can bring the two sides together. That is our tool we need to investigate. Now, OK, so how are you going to do this? Well, there's really two paths to this reconciliation. There's this thing called program synthesis, which is growing um, in the community. It's a way you can understand black, um, hardware as a black box by asking it questions, and you build up a behavior of it as a program. You can then, from that, generate lots of different examples and, gener and generalize, and then you can put them as constraints. We know how to generate constraints to find these things. We know how to do program synthesis. This is the bit in the middle. So that way, we, for a certain domain of hardware, we can bring the two together. You can also use machine learning. You can model what hardware does as a black box. You can model what programs do as a black box. People in approximation have done this already. You can use a thing called distillation, which brings them down to a canonical form and match the two together. The nice thing is the duality, so if it doesn't work on this path, you can jump over to the other path. So this is what I think we need to do. We need to look at how we can bring the two together via automation. So in summary, I think we as compiler writers, and I'm glad to hear Lawrence has talked before, are the bridge between software and hardware. We have to understand that contract. I think we need to radically rethink compiler design rather than top down. It needs to be bottom up and cooperative. We have to match idiosyncratic hardware to software without changing any of the software because people don't like that. And the technologies we have to use are new ones such as constraints, program synthesis, and machine learning. If we can do that, then we can also ask what is the best hardware to match. So that way we bring the hardware people back into the fold. They can have a new, new uh, game to play called performance versus coverage to design their hardware. And if it works, we can reconcile software and hardware for the end of Moore's law. So if I want to reflect back on what we're looking at, we've been looking at really the end of the contract. So no longer are software and hardware are going to work together, but we can be inspired by Pear's hobby. And nearly everybody knows what Pear's hobby is. It's sailing, right? <laughs> so rather than a contract, we can have a partnership, which is, I can't think of a more Swedish view of things than that. So, <laughs> so on that note, we have to rethink the hardware soft contract and we have to think about heterogeneous thinking. So that's it, thank you. Thank you.
we have some time for questions. So it's wonderful talk, uh, Michael, you know, but I'm still not convinced. And are, are you ever? No. <laughs> <laughs> it would be against my nature. <laughs> but the issue is that well, what you said is that we're going to take, let's see if I understood this well. You take the software and you throw it in you know, a black box with the hardware and it will learn what it can do and then it will generate some auto optimization based on what it knows and so forth. But if this is all automated and we all use, you know, AI or whatever it is, the end result, how would I know what came out? How could I actually improve? Where is the innovation going to kick in, right? Sure. It's you're optimizing a problem for what it is, but you need to go to the next problem. You need to be in business, right? Sure. So, so what's the answer to that? Okay, so if you look back at, uh, I won't do this too often, this slide here. What's nice is you can use machine learning, right? But there's a whole way for every single machine learning model, you, you can actually infer, this this area called explainable AI, a program that is its equivalent. And you can reason about programs. So you can use machine learning to build models, and then you can de develop a program that actually matches that model. So there's no longer an either or approach. You can use uh, machine learning to actually be a fast way of learning approximate behavior. Then you can actually get a program. And if you don't like the look of that program, you can then refine it. So I don't think there's any, this idea that machine learning is a black box is not uh, understandable. It's a real problem. But with the explainable AI work that's going on at the moment, I think we can bring the two together. So I don't think it's an either or anymore. They actually can work together. You get inspired by machine learning to be understand behavior. You can actually describe that as a program, and then you can reformulate what you want to do. So I don't think it's an either or problem. Okay? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of this stuff that I just don't understand. Let's uh, move back a couple of slides where you actually have the box and the hardware is. Uh, there you go. Uh, this next one? No, no. That one? You, the, uh, that one, fine. Sure. So these two things at the bottom are pieces of hardware yeah. that are going that have to be talked to. That is, you have to. This, this doesn't. Yeah. You, it's on? Okay. So. I, maybe I'm wrong, but I would think that the output of that LLVM yeah. is a sequence of zeros and ones that's going to tell the hardware what to do. Is that right? Um, no. Th in this particular case, we actually, there's a, this is a simplification. Where it's a source-to-source -source compiler, which will give a host piece of code, which gets compiled to zeros and ones, and a call to an API like CL Blast or something. This piece of hardware is doing a fast Fourier transform, yes. or yeah. so it's, that's all it's doing is a fast Fourier transform. Sure. So for every accelerator, if you yeah. will, I'm going to need another piece of hardware. Well, for every well, if every accelerator that you provide is an, an right, 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 right. Uh, the interface to that accelerator. Yeah is going to be zeros and ones or not? It's going to be an API like a call. I'm sorry? It's going to be an API like a call. So it'll be basically the signature of the subroutine call. So it'll be, say, say like call matrix modification. It'll be a library. It'll okay. be a library interface. And what I have to do is the library will already be implemented on there, like CL Blast will be running. And then you then have to match that Blast routine against the user code. That, that's okay, so I, there's, a, there's a lot there that I would have to come to to understand, but that's my problem, not yours. Um, machine learning. Yeah. So maybe I don't know anything about machine learning. I'm sure you do. <laughs> uh, I thought that what machine learning was doing yes. was you train it yep. on a set of, uh, uh, let's say, a set of points where yep. each point is in a huge dimensional space. Sure. And you train it on millions of these points. Yep. But each one of these points has an outcome. Yep. I don't get the outcome per point that is going to drive this, this so, thing. So what you do, you have an interface that describes how you can communicate. Say so it can take an A and a B and return a C. You generate lots of A's and B's, you look at the C's, and you realize it's actually doing an add rather than a multiply. So you, defer, you develop its functionality based on the input-out behavior. I guess I have a lot of learning yet to do. <laughs> we all do. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In the interest of time, I think we should move on to the next speaker. Thank, Thank you. you. No problem. Thanks for your presentation.